In Psalms 89.1, the scripture says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. So don't panic, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> but I'll tell you of his faithfulness to all generations. <clears throat> and I want you to see what I'm going to tell you about is 20 days drifting on a life raft. I don't know if any of you knew it or not. But 20 days drifting on life raft. I want you to see the one who brought me through the experience, not the one who went through it. I don't want you, don't, don't pay attention to me. I want you to see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that brought me through the experience. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> My parents were missionaries in the Central African Republic, which in the old days used to be the French Equatorial Africa. And where that white dot is, is where I grew up and I was raised. So I'm kind of a wild person. (laughs) Not really, though. But they served in the Central African Republic. And on our way home, we were on our way home because of illness in the family. And it was during World War II. We think my mother had uh, vaginal cancer, no proof at that time, back in 1942. And my father had an abscessed liver. So, uh, and then the rest of us kids, we were full of malaria. And I had hookworm and filaria worm. And I was full of worms because <laughs> I kept eating stuff all the time without sterilizing it. Anyway, so we had to take the chance of coming back to the United States during World War II. Now, here in, uh, this is a picture of my family. This is our passport picture. There's, that's a picture of, there's me in the hat. Of course, I'm the only boy, you can tell that's me. I was 13 years old then. And my sister Georgia, on the other end, was at that time, she, she was uh, a 10 or 11. And my little sister in the center, Carol, she was eight years old at that time. My sister Georgia and I, we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior the same morning in 1942. But the thing is, I kept getting under conviction. Growing up in a missionary's family, I knew all about the plan of salvation. I knew all the scripture verses and everything. But you know what? My dad would be preaching to the Africans in the African language. And by hearing the gospel message in the African language of Songo, that I became under conviction. In other words, it wasn't English that convicted me. It was the African language that convicted me of my sin. And I accepted Christ as my personal Savior then. The same, same morning that my sister did, my sister Georgia. So we uh, came down the Congo River from, from Bangi. What? Uh, and uh, we landed at the place called, uh, came down the Congo River all the way to Matadi, which was a port at, uh, on the coast by Angola. And, uh, we, and we, what we did was we, uh, we got this ship, the West Lashaway. <coughs> it, it was a nice, peaceful day that I'm speaking about right now. The sea was very peaceful and calm. We need to always trust in Jesus during calm times, not necessarily wait until something bad happens. We need to trust in Jesus when everything is calm and peaceful. So that's the picture of the ship right there. And on August the 30th, 1942, at 2 p.m., something happened that changed my whole life. 
a German, two torpedoes from a German submarine sank the ship in a minute and a half. That whole ship was completely underwater in a minute and a half's time. And uh, approximately 65 to 70 people on board. Only 30 people made it onto the surface. Half the crew and passengers were missing because the ship sank so fast. And uh, out of the missing was my mother and my sister Georgia who went down with the ship. My father was badly wounded by shrapnel. He'd been hit in the head. And the last time I seen him, blood was running down his side of his head where he'd been hit with shrapnel. And he was wounded, and he was placed on a different raft. Now, this is the way the rafts were aboard ship. They were set on the angle iron so that if you released a hook, it would slide down into the water. Otherwise, it was set so if the ship went out from under it, it would just automatically lift out of the rack and be floating on the water. But notice between there the barrels. There's, there's three barrels and three barrels on the other side. Those were air tanks, buoyancy tanks. And uh, the... They, they were set to catch, but you see, we didn't have all, all the, from the shrapnel and everything that was flying around from the torpedoes, the buoyancy in three of the rafts were punctured. So the raft would only hold five to seven people without going underwater. Our raft still had uh, buoyancy tanks. And uh, we had 19 of us on our raft, and yet we were only about 10 to a foot out of the water. So that, that's how it went with us. And the raft was 8 feet wide and 10 feet long. And like I said, 19 of us because of the air tanks. We drifted together for three days. And because we were due in Trinidad, this was on Sunday afternoon, and we were due in Trinidad, West Indies, on Tuesday morning. So we stayed together for three days, all of us stayed together and drifted together in hopes that when we didn't show up, they'd come out looking for us and we'd all be there. Well, it turned out that after three days, not, nobody showed up. So we decided to split up. My dad's raft, he was put, like I said, he was placed on a different raft. And uh, his raft drifted pretty close to ours. And so when I got up, or when we got real close to him, he gave me all his food to split between me and my little sister Carol. So that's the memory I have of my father of giving his kids, giving us kids all his food. Now, here, there, there's, the, there's the picture of the raft, eight feet wide and ten feet long. And you notice that uh, the... It, you just, what we did was we sat all around the edges on the inside with our feet inside. And we just sat around out on, on the outer edge all on that life raft like that. And uh, so then uh, here, here's what we look like. That's an artist's picture. An artist drew that picture. And uh, that's what we look like. Notice the shark fin there on the left side of the picture. And uh, they were our constant companions. I, I, watching TV today, I don't like to watch sharks on TV. I can't stand the sight of them. But anyway, that's what we looked like. That was an artist's picture. But I want you to notice the shape 
uh, of the way the picture is. We've got that long tele- that long oar tied up with a flag on it coming all the way down, and we've got the canvas on the top on the four corners. I want you to remember that shape. Now, we had the canvas there. For I want you to, we had the canvas there, so in case it rained, it sagged in the middle, and we had a hole poked in the center of the canvas. So in case it rained, the rainwater would go to that hole, and we could get water. And uh, <clears throat> notice too that there's no, we don't have any backrests there, so. We're just sitting there around in the circle in there in that raft, only ten inches of the foot of the water. Sharks were our constant companions. We had to be careful not to let our hands fall in the water. You know, let your hand just drop over at the edge. Or at night time when we slept we had to be careful not to let our hands fall all over either. Now one thing about at night time See, when we were on this raft, we were always wet. For the whole 20 days, that's how long we drifted on the life raft, 20 days. For the whole 20 days, we were never dry. We were always wet. Our clothes were wet. And so when we slept at night, us kids, we would sleep sandwiched on top of each other. There was the guy on the bottom, or the person on the bottom had a cold tummy and a warm back. And the one, two in the middle had a warm tummy and a warm back. And the one on top had a cold back and a warm tummy. <laughs> so, and then we'd alternate and take turn time, take, take turns doing that. But that's the way we slept. We were always wet like that. So, Talk about so much rain <laughs> today. <laughs> of course, I hadn't gotten wet, though, but anyway. And while we were drifting, two men died on our raft and were buried at sea. One, one, the one guy was stark naked. He had been, at the time the ship was torpedoed, he was taking a shower. And the ship sank in a minute and a half. He didn't have time to get dressed. He's lucky he ever even got out. So we had to find some kind of canvas and rags and cover him up, you know. But anyway, he died of exposure. And then two days later, the captain on the raft, he died too. So we had the two men. But what we did was all we could do was feed them to the sharks, roll them off the raft. That was the only thing that was there. And... uh I saw the sharks feed on the bodies of these two men not more than two or three feet in front of me. So that's the reason why I don't like to watch TV with sharks. <laughs> but anyhow, that's the way it went. Now, there was four rafts that were on the ocean, but two other rafts were never heard of again. We don't know to this day. We don't know what happened to him. But my dad's raft, the raft that he was on, drifted on the island of St. Vincent in the West Indies. And it was dad's raft because they found his wallet in the food container a couple of days later. So he made it, he made it to... Uh, his raft made it to the island of St. Vincent. Now, I wanted to tell you, too, on the ship, we had another lady missionary by the name of Ethel Bell. And she had two children. She had Mary, who was 13, a girl Mary, who was 13, and Robert Bell, who was 11. And so there was us four kids that were together, and we, we were really pretty close. And uh, Mrs. Bell, she, she would, uh, they, whenever it came time to eat our food or something like that, they, Mrs. Bell would ask the blessing over our food. 
which wasn't very much, I'll tell you here in a minute, what it was. And a lot of the guys wouldn't eat their food until Mrs. Bell asked the blessing. So that that was the way it went. And uh, what we had was our food supply was for five people, enough for five people for three days. Nine, Seventeen of us stretched that into 21 days. So you, I don't recommend that kind of a diet. <laughs> I don't care what the TV says. Don't don't do it that way. <laughs> yeah, don't do it that way. <laughs> and water was four ounces of water a day. So that that was the way things were for us at that time. Now, what I want to share with you is God's grace and mercy. On the ship, part of the cargo the ship was carrying was palm oil. And there was a lot of palm oil on the surface of the water when the ship went down, so that when you came up from that you were coated, you were coated with this palm oil. And it was kind of a miserable thing to be pasty all up with this raw palm oil and everything else. But you know what? It was God's grace and God's mercy. It turned out to be a blessing. You know why? Here we were in the tropics in the Caribbean, in the hot sun. And, you know, you don't go to the swimming pool without putting on sun, lo- or sun, sun lotion or something. Here we were coated with palm oil. And you'll find that half the stuff that you, when you get the stuff to go on the swimming pool or something, you look on there and you'll see it's either palm oil or some kind of oil. <laughs> and here we're not a one of us in the whole 21 days, not a one of us had any sunburn. That palm oil kept us coated and protected. It was God's mercy and His grace. And then another God's grace and God's mercy was we ran out of drinking water. And uh, the Scripture tells us in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 17 and 18 and 20a, which reads as follows, When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this. Well, what's interesting here was we saw this rain cloud off in the distance on the horizon. And, of course, the wind was going, moving it away from us. And one of the men on the life raft said, Mrs. Bell, would you pray and ask God to shift the wind and bring that rain over to us? And you know what? Within about 15 minutes... The wind changed and it shifted and it brought this rain cloud right over the raft. Now here, we'd been drifting now for about a week and a half, almost two weeks. Our bodies are pretty tender, you know, being out there like that. And it rained so hard that the raindrops kind of almost stung you (laughs) because it came down so hard and it just poured, it just poured down. And of course, we had the cup at the canvas, you know, where the hole was in the center of the canvas. And we had our two water kegs. We got our two water kegs filled up. Plus, after we got the water kegs filled up, we got to passing that cup around so everybody gets something to drink. Well, you know, by the time that cup came around to me several times, I was so full of water that if I could have walked, I'd have gone, delish, delish, delish. <laughs> You'd have heard me splashing. <laughs> and, 
But anyway, we got both the water kegs plumb full of water, and uh, and the rest of us were all full of water also. And so then, so we wouldn't have a miserable night. Mrs. Bell asked the Lord, not that we were ungrateful or anything else, but she asked the Lord if He would shift the wind again so that we could have a halfway decent night and wouldn't be in the rain. And you know what? The wind shifted again, and it moved the rain away from us. Now, when I was a kid growing up in a Christian home and reading Bible stories and everything else, I've heard of miracles of all these different things that took place. But this was the first time I ever literally saw one when he changed the rain, the wind for the rain. And it, it, was, it, it, it made an impression upon me. And another thing of God's grace and mercy was, now mind you, we are real hungry. Because we've been drifting now for, oh, at this time it was about two weeks. We'd been drifting already and hardly had anything to eat. And we were real hungry. And this one guy, out of the first aid kit, he got a safety pin. He had a piece of cord that was about that long and it was about that thick. And he just peeled her down, tied it together, and just made a little string out of it. And on the end of it, he got the safety pin out of the first aid kit and put it on the end and threw it out like he was fishing. Now, fishing with a safety pin, you can't catch anything very, very big with a safety, without bending that safety pin. I can remember as a kid, I used to try fishing with a safety pin, and it didn't work. But anyway, God's grace and God's mercy, something silver in the ocean water. Now, it won't work in the Mississippi. It's too muddy. But in the ocean water, something silver is attractive. And it shows in the clear sea water. And the shark pilot, the shark pilot is a fish that follows the shark and eats the scraps and everything that the shark leaves behind. And they get to be, here's the fish story now, they get to be about 18 inches long. They get to be pretty good size. And this guy, he worked, he, he noticed the shark pilot come up nosing, nosing the safety pin, and he kept bringing it in slowly, and, and that shark pilot kept coming and kept coming. Pretty soon he got right there at the edge where he was at, and he reached over with his hand, Got and reached in there and hooked his finger in the gill of that shark pilot and brought it on the life raft. He caught, we caught that shark pilot. You know what? It worked twice. He did it again. And another time it did it again too. Now, if you notice the picture on the raft, you don't see a stove anywhere. What do you think happened to those two shark pilots <laughs> you know what? When I ate that raw meat, I could feel the strength going into my, flowing into my body. I could, I could feel it. It just felt, I felt stronger or something. I felt, but I could tell from eating that meat. So that was God's grace and God's mercy for raw fish. And it was really, it was really delicious. And I was telling the story one time at a church in Wyoming, and when I got done, one of the ladies in the congregation asked me, what kept the sharks from taking one of you off the life raft, or anybody off the life raft? Well, for one thing, sharks don't jump out of the water. I don't care what the movies show. Sharks don't jump out of the water. And I told her, I said, beside... I said, she saw what we did to those two shark pilots. She, no shark wanted to take the chance <laughs> of trying to take us off the raft. <laughs> I said, if one of them did, we'd have had him eaten before he got back in the water. <laughs> so, but uh, she, she was curious there. Now then, one time in the evening, 
This was this was uh, oh we'd been about two two and a half weeks drifting now, and uh, now we used to see airplanes every day, but they'd be so high up, you know, they wouldn't see us a little speck down in the water, you know, and uh, we'd see them every day. But this one evening we were sitting down, relaxing after devotions, and all of a sudden we heard. A plane coming low and coming real low, and it came over and it passed over us and it saw us and it dropped food to us. So we were pretty thankful for that. And so we got we got we had a little extra more food. But the thing is that in the meantime he circled us several times. It wasn't a seaplane; it was a regular land plane. He circled two or three times. What he was doing was radioing our position to wherever it was he was radioing. I don't know. But that next day, that next morning, when we woke up, we saw a ship on the horizon. And the way it was doing its searching, we knew it was looking for us. It was searching for us. But we would already drifted so far off point that... They didn't see us. So you can imagine the despair of watching that ship disappear over the horizon, you know. So anyhow, well, but we got some food from the plane. And so that took care of a little bit again. But uh, now the thing I want to share with you is Mrs. Bell, you know, here we... uh, here, you know, here we were, starving, and Mrs. Bell would ask the blessing over the food. Nobody would eat their food until she prayed and asked the blessing. You would think that when you're starving, and boom, boy, you'd throw that in right quick, you know. And uh, but nobody did. And Mrs. Bell had 42 devotions. She'd had she, when she was a young lady. She used to belong to a BMA, Bible Memory Association. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. But she, where they memorized Scripture. Now, we had no Bible, we had no Testament, we had nothing. And she turned around what she would do from memory that she had learned all those times. She had 42 devotions, never repeating herself, except maybe to say that that's what I meant this morning for this verse, but she'd taken another verse every time. And she held 42 diver- devotions. And it's the Word of God that to this day, I believe it was the Word of God that kept us sane the whole time that we were drifting in that hot tropical weather and everything like that. It was the Word of God. Because, you see, when we were rescued which I'll tell you about later, when we were rescued, they commented on different fishermen who had been lost at sea or been drifting out at sea for a week or four or five days, and they went insane, went out of their heads. And here they, and they said in Barbados, the hospital, they said it was a miracle, like Jesus feeding the 5,000. We were sound as a dollar. Nobody, nobody was, nobody was insane. So I contribute that to the Word of God, kept our hearts and minds to the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, on the twenty-first day, now the food we got from the plane, we kind of ate it pretty quick because we thought we'd be rescued right away. And so, on the twenty-first day, our food was all gone. And we gave out the last of our food that morning for breakfast. That morning, my breakfast was a malted milk tablet. That's all I had. That was between me and death. I I think I inhaled that malted milk tablet. I don't remember. I don't remember chewing it. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I had was that malted milk tablet. And we and we settled back to die. Because we'd get no more food, and everybody on the raft was out, and we just settled back to die. 
And uh, pretty soon one guy turned around and he says, he says, oh, there's a ship over there. Well, nobody paid any attention because we've seen clouds that look like ships and things like that at different times and everything. So nobody really paid too much attention. He says, yeah, nobody even bothered to look up. And he says, yeah, there's a ship there. So one guy looked up. He says, yeah, there sure enough is. And about that time, it was a British destroyer that was escorting a convoy. And about that time, that British destroyer opened fire on us because they thought we were a submarine on the surface, coming to the surface. Now, remember I told you, remember the silhouette of that picture, the oar tied up? Looked like a periscope and part of a conning tower. Off in the distance, they couldn't make out. And so that they opened fire, and they fired at us 16 times. If we'd have been a submarine, they'd have been clobbering the daylights out of us. Because we were hanging on to the raft, because the raft, the shells would land right in front, and the raft would be bobbing around. We were hanging on to the raft so we wouldn't fall off. And But they, they, they really did the job. But then when we took the oar down we, with the fly, we took down, waved it from one edge to the water to the other, they quit firing and came over to us, came over to rescue us. And uh, there, that's the British destroyer. That's the Vimy, HMS Vimy. And uh, it's the actual picture of the destroyer. Now, I got these pictures. You may be wondering where I got these pictures. I got them from the archives. And some of them are from the British British archives. This picture of the Vimy and some of the other pictures. The other pictures that I've shown are, are from the the Barber line. That's the company that the West Lyser Way was under. But now this here is from the British archives. And that's the Vimy. And uh, they... Uh, here's a... There's, there's what we looked like when they rescued us. We had, you see where we had the flag waved it from one edge to the other, and that's when they quit firing on us. But uh, you can see we're really packed there. I don't even know where I'm at. I'm in there somewhere. But, <laughs> but uh, there's 17 people, and you can see we're not very far out of the water from the weight of all of us people on there. So that's that was taken from the destroyer, which has come from the British archives also. And uh, then we they t and then they rescued us and when we got when I got on the destroyer they took me to a cabin and I got to lay down. And it felt so good on my back, you know, I got there for 21 days and no backrest and everything else. I actually got to stretch out straight and lay down and went to sleep. And pretty soon the sailor woke me up and came into the room. He woke me up. He says, here's something to eat. He made me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. To this day, that's my favorite sandwich. <laughs> In fact, I like peanut butter, crunch, and grape jelly with it, and that, that's what I, I eat that quite a bit even to this day. But that whole sandwich, I had the whole sandwich. I thought I was having a banquet. You know, that morning all I did was swallow a malted milk tablet, and that was my breakfast, and I thought, you know, no more. Now I'm eating this whole, this big peanut. Well, it was big to me, you know. This peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and man, I thought it was a banquet. Man, I really <laughs> it didn't take me long to get rid of it either. <laughs> but uh, so they, we got we were here's a here's a picture of the captain of the Vimy, the destroyer, carrying my sister Carol. 
And she, the whole time, the 22 day, 21 days on the life raft, the whole time, my sister Carol had a broken arm. When the torpedoes hit the ship, it blew her up and she landed down and broke her arm. And so we all had to be careful on the life raft. That when we bumped, we had to be careful not to bump her and her broken arm. And here's a picture that you can't see. She's got one arm up on his shoulder, but I don't know where the other arm's at. But anyway, he, the captain had carried this picture in his wallet the whole rest of the war. He told what happened was my sister, he had a detective in the United States trying to find out who that, find out who that little girl was. Well, my sister was in college up in Minnesota, and she told the story of the life raft. She told what I'm telling you tonight. She told the story, and there was a, a man in the congregation who used to be the pastor of the church that sent support to my mom and dad in Africa, and we, and we knew him. And so he met my sister, and of course there was a write-up in the paper in St. Paul, Minnesota. Well, here's this detective that was here looking for my sister. He sees the write-up in the Hawkeye, and right away he got the detective got a hold of the captain and told him, and the captain, what he did, got got my sister and took her to the telephone, and she got to talk to the captain, transatlantic telephone. Talked to him, and he sent her this picture. He said he carried it in his wallet the whole rest of the time during the rest of the war. So, anyhow, she's being carried. Now, the question come up, how many of you thought about where was the restroom? Uh-huh. That always comes up. Well, for one thing, we never had enough food for a bile, so there was nothing that way. But, remember I said we were always wet? We were never dry? So we'd just go ahead and wet our pants. And no sooner get done, a wave would swash up on there and wash you off anyway. So that took that took care of the that took care of the bathroom. So that's the way that went. Hey, let's see here. What's next? Oh, well, I'm done. Now I got something I want to read to you here, and then I'm going to close. I wrote this letter August the sixth, two thousand one. Dear relation and friends, I guess what I have to say, I'd better start at the beginning. Some of you may know bits and pieces about what I'm going to say, but now I will bring you all up to date. Back in 1985, six of us who were on the raft had a reunion with our families in Pulaski, Tennessee. Some of us hadn't seen each other since 1942 when we were separated to come to the United States. Well, at this reunion, I talked with George Morano, one of the men who was on our raft, and he told me that he saw Elliot Gurney, the one man left on my dad's raft, at survivor's camp in Trinidad back in 1942. I asked George Morano, if Elliot Gurney had said anything to him about my dad. George Morano replied that I was better off to just leave things alone, which I thought he was trying to spare my feelings. All these years, I believe my dad died at sea and was eaten by sharks just as the two men who died on our raft were. I had accepted that for years, and as an old sailor myself, made it easier to understand. See, I spent eight years in the Navy later on. 
Somebody asked me, what in the world did I do? Why did I join the Navy after after this raft experience? I want to get right down to it. The sea was the only thing I knew. <laughs> so I felt right at home. I spent six years at sea out of eight years in the Navy in World War II in Korea. Yeah, okay, now, all I ever knew was there was this one man alive, which was Elliot Gurney, and knew it was Dad's raft that landed on St. Vincent in the West Indies because several days later they found my dad's wallet in the food box with checks and his name on them. These checks were sent to the mission board my parents served under and were put in the estate of my sister and I for when we became 21 years of age. For years, 59 years, all I ever knew was one man alive and Dad's wallet. That's all I ever knew for 59 years. In 1993, my sister Donna went to a Bible conference in St. Vincent, and I suggested to my sister Donna was Carol. She was adopted, and they changed her name to Donna. So this is Carol I'm talking about. My sister Carol, or Donna, went to a Bible conference in St. Vincent, and I suggested if she had time to look up in the library for papers dating back to September 1942 and see if there was anything or a story of Dad's raft coming to the island. Sure enough, she found an article telling of the rescue, and it also stated that there were two bodies with Elliot Gurney that we knew that we never knew anything about. One was identified, and the other one was unidentified. The identified one was later claimed by his family. And the unidentified one was buried there in St. Vincent in an unmarked grave. I became concerned about the unidentified body since they didn't find Dad's wallet until several days later. When my sister went down there in 1993, she stopped at Barbados where we were rescued and put in the newspaper her picture of back then and if anyone remembered her and the story behind it, that she would be back in Barbados on such a date and time that she would like to see them. Well, a man by the name of George Hutchinson came to the airport on her way back. George Hutchinson was a young boy of 14 in 1942 who used to come to the hospital to visit me and Robert Bell, who was on the raft with me. After some people, for a while, he used to come and every day and play with us, and we became close friends. Anyway, I have been in contact with George Hutchinson ever since 1993. Before he retired, he worked for the cable and wireless, which he worked on different islands besides just Barbados. At different times, he was on St. Vincent and was doing some searching for us at different times said that his information pointed to the fact that the unidentified body might have or could be my dad, but no real proof. He was checking around with different people who might remember, but nothing definite. Anyway, these little bits of information over the couple of years was building up inside of me until Labor Day of 1998, I realized then it was 56 years on that day that it was the last time I saw my dad, and it all came to a head. I was on my way to my daughter Ruth's house here in Burlington, and I knew I had to get there right away. When I got to her house, I just grabbed her and broke down sobbing. I explained to her what was wrong and felt greatly relieved after it was over. I went back home and I didn't say anything to Evelyn, that's my wife, as I didn't think any more of it. The next day, my daughter Ruth called home and asked Evelyn how I was doing since I have, had, since I have heart trouble and she was concerned about me. Evelyn said, fine, why? Then Ruth told her what I had done. Evelyn told Ruth to call up George Morano in Florida 
and tell him of the bits of information we had been finding out and ask him what it was he wouldn't tell me at the reunion in 1985. He told Ruth that the unidentified man was my dad and that he had died during rescue. Elliot Gurney told George that in survivor's camp in Trinidad. Well, that gave my sister and me some closure that we never ever had before. Some might say, why didn't George tell us that back in 1985 at the reunion? But I'm glad he didn't because I don't believe I was ready for that information at that time. God was preparing me little by little for later on to be able to handle it. I'm not sure I could have handled it back in 1985. This is, the end. is this the end of the news? No, not yet, for there is some more to come. In February of this year, 2001, my daughter Ruth and her doctor friend and another doctor and his wife went to St. Vincent and while there started asking some questions. They hired a cab to take them to the village of Sandy Bay as we had learned Dad's raft came in at Old Sandy Bay. Also in the village they talked of different people who are now in their 70s and 80s who remembered the incident real well. This one lady saw the raft being brought in and described the appearance of the men. One was short, balding, and very hairy, which fit Dad to a T. <laughs> I knew it was him when Ruth told me that this la- what this lady had said, and also her husband both had said that, and it had said they also said the unidentified man was buried in Georgetown Cemetery, and the unidentified one, Dad, was buried in Georgetown Anglican Cemetery because he was a missionary. Being a religious person, they felt it was, and it was should he should be buried in the church cemetery. Elliot Gurney told his rescuers he should be buried. It was. It was in the paper that he learned how to pray from the missionary with him. So that must be how they knew Dad was a missionary. This married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Osmond, who both of them individually saw the raft come in and saw the bodies. They were 13 years old then and on their way to school when all this happened. Of course, they were not married then, but they both saw the bodies along with a few others. After I relayed all this information to my sister that Ruth had found out, a little while later, my sister called and suggested that her and I go down to St. Vincent. And Evelyn said, not without her. So we, we made the plans in 2001, and on July, let's see, and on July 10th, 2001, this, this year, we drove down to my sister's in Arkansas, and on July 13th, we left from Little Rock Airport to Fort Worth, Texas, and then on to Miami. By nighttime, we met George Hutchinson in Barbados. That was the first time I had seen George since I left Barbados in 1942, 59 years ago. Yes, there were some tears of joy when we saw each other. <clears throat> we left Barbados for St. Vincent on July 16th and arrived at 9 a.m. Some missionary friends of my sisters met us at the airport and took us right to the village of Sandy Bay near the north tip of the island. There we met the Osmonds who Ruth, my daughter, had talked to about back in February. Mr. Osmond told us that he had seen the raft when it was out from the beach and alerted the village. The raft was still out a little ways. When Mrs. Osmond saw me, she said the unidentified man looked just like me. And we also showed them both pictures of my dad, and they both said that was him. 
They also told us about this man, Mr. Nero, who was 83 years old, still getting around in Sharper's attack, who lived a few houses up the street. He was, he was one of the men who helped bring the raft in at Old Sandy Bay, which is the name of the beach area. Again, showing pictures of Dad, Mr. Nero said that was him and that I looked like my dad too. He told us something that really surprised us, and that was that my dad was still alive, but semi-unconscious as Mr. Nero helped Dad get on a stretcher and helped carry him to an ambulance. At the top of the road, and that my dad, let's see, the ambulance at the top of the road, and that my dad had died on the way to the hospital. What a joy it was to talk to people who actually had a hand in all this. Mr. Osmond and his wife went with us to the old Sandy Bay and showed us the exact spot where the raft came in. So my sister and I were both in the same spot. We later went to the Anglican Cemetery with them, where Mr. Nero and Mrs. O Mr. Osmond said Dad was buried. But it was an area of 50 feet with several unmarked graves. There was no way to know the exact grave spot, but we were within 50 feet of it. All in all, this has given my sister and myself a lot of closure, which we never had before after 59 years of believing Dad was eaten by sharks having died at sea. Dad drifted for 26 days, and in all that despair, which I remember very well of our 21 days, God let Dad see land, and then he saw the face of Jesus. I find real comfort in realizing this. Mr. Nero said to me, if you don't find his actual grave, you know where he is, don't you? And as he said that, he pointed his finger upward. Everything was moving so fast, we didn't find out if he was a Christian or not. But he seemed to know what he was doing when he pointed upward with a big smile like he was ready to go there too. We think the Osmonds were Christians too, as they had a well-used Bible on their table, which we could tell wasn't for ornament. It had been used a lot. On October the 5th of October, Evelyn and I will have our 50th wedding anniversary, so we thought of this trip being something to celebrate our 50th. We arrived in the U.S. on July 24th, so we are now home and resting up from being on the go so much. Well, my relation and good friends, it seems like this is the end of the story until that one great day the Lord comes and takes us home to be with Him. Wishing you all the best, and I am grateful to our Lord for the closure He has given to us. With love in Christ, your cousin and friend, Richard. So there's a lot of things that were found out a little bit later that I never knew, you know. And uh, I'll uh, see, does anybody have any questions? Might as well check that out. Was it just you and your sister alive? Yeah. Yeah, just me and my sister. My sister lives in Conway, Arkansas now. In fact, I just talked to her. Let's see, this is Sunday. I just talked to her last Thursday. Thursday night. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I never thought of it. <laughs> well, there is a book written about it by the name of In Peril on the Sea. Robert Bell wrote that. And the other question is, did you ever learn a foreign language? Did what? Did you ever learn a foreign language? You found out that. <laughs> yes, I did. I speak French and Songo. Songo is the African language. 
You found that out last. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we were both when we first came to the United States. We came to the Westervelt home in Batesburg, South Carolina, but uh, it didn't work out. They they didn't know how to handle me. And I couldn't stand them. <laughs> and so, so after about uh, after about three or four months, or I had the privilege of being kicked out. <laughs> that was a blessing. <laughs> and uh, and they had the rule in this home that the boys could not talk to the sisters or could not talk to the girls. So here was my sister. Not more than two or three months ago, we were rescued and lost our parents. I couldn't talk to her. And then at this home, there were other girls who I grew up with in Africa that were friends of my sister Georgia. I couldn't talk to them either because they weren't related to me. So I was glad to get out of that place. So from there on, I went to a bunch of different foster homes. Until I was 17 years old, and I joined the Navy. Uh, well, I guess that's it. You want to close that song? How do I how, how do I turn this off? Okay.